안녕하십니까? Nicolas and in today's video I want to talk to you about GraphQL. This is because we just finished recording, subtitling and uploading a free two and a half hour GraphQL course that you can take right now for free. But before you click on the link below, watch this video until the end because we are going to talk about GraphQL. Where does it come from? Why was it created? What problems does it fix? And most importantly of all, who should learn GraphQL? Now, GraphQL was created by Facebook and it has been powering the Facebook apps since 2012. Now, in 2015, Facebook open-sourced the GraphQL specification. Specification, or spec, means that GraphQL is just a set of rules and ideas written on a paper. That is the paper that was open-sourced. GraphQL is just an idea, and for this reason, you cannot actually go to a website and click download GraphQL. What we can actually download and use are GraphQL implementations. Implementations are created by really cool people that sit and read the GraphQL specification and translate those rules to actual code. This means that GraphQL is not actually bounded to any specific language. You can use GraphQL in JavaScript, Python, Rust, C Sharp, Java, whatever you want, as long as somebody implemented the GraphQL spec. Now, to understand why GraphQL was created, we have to understand what problem does it fix. So now let's talk about what is the point of GraphQL. GraphQL was created by Facebook to fix some problems that they were having with REST APIs. So for this, we have to remember what APIs are. An API is an interface that we can use in this context to communicate with a server. In your iPhone or Android, you have the Instagram app. This Instagram app has to communicate with the Facebook's servers. This communication happens using an API. Now, the most popular kind of API is a REST API, and REST APIs are very easy to understand. The way REST APIs work is by having multiple URLs. Every URL is different and unique, and they all give you a different kind of data. Let's take the Twitter REST API, for example. If you use the Twitter app or the website, when you go to the profile of Elon Musk, for example, your app or your browser are both going to send a request to this URL. This is a URL that will give you all the tweets for a user provided the ID. That ID in this case is the ID of Elon Musk on Twitter's database. And this URL will not return a website. We are usually used to URLs returning a website. When you go to youtube.com, you are used to seeing a website. For this kind of URL, which is a REST API URL, will not give you a website. It will give you just data. And it will give you data in a JSON format. Now, this data is what your iPhone or your browser are going to take, and then they are going to paint it in a beautiful way. Now, the Twitter REST API is full of this kind of URLs. If, for example, we want to know who is Elon Musk following, we will have to visit a URL like this one. Or if we want to know who is following Elon Musk, all we have to do is go to a URL like this one. These URLs are actually not visited by humans. This is the URL that your phone would request to get that data. And like I said, the REST API of Twitter is full of URLs like this that are very useful for every different case. For example, if we search for the word banana on the Twitter app for iOS and Android, the Twitter app is going to send a request to the Twitter API to a URL like this one, searching for banana. This way of structuring an API by creating a different URL for everything is called REST. And REST APIs are really, really popular. But REST has two big problems that Facebook ran into, and they are called overfetching and underfetching. To fix these two problems is why Facebook created GraphQL. So let's start with overfetching. Overfetching means that you receive more data than what you actually need. So for example, using the excellent The Movie Database REST API, which is a database that you can use to get almost any info you want on movies or TV shows, if we want to know which movies are coming up soon, all we have to do is go to the slash movie slash upcoming URL. Now, when we receive that response, we're going to receive something like this. As you can see here, we get data about the movie, the title, the popularity, the release date, among many other things. Now, please imagine that we were making a movie app and we receive this data, but what we actually show to the user is just the title of the movie. If we do this, if we only show the title of the movie and nothing else, we are basically wasting all the data that we just received. It doesn't make sense to fetch all that data if we are not going to use it, and that is overfetching. 
Instead, if we were able to only ask for the data that we actually are going to need, the database wouldn't work so hard and the data that has to travel between the server and the phone, for example, wouldn't be so big, making the loading time less. GraphQL fixes this. GraphQL is a query language. That is the QL in GraphQL. GraphQL allows you to specifically ask for the server for exactly what you need. If the movie database was using GraphQL instead of REST, rather than sending a request to this URL and getting all this data and then wasting that data, we would instead send a query using GraphQL to the server. And the query would look something like this. With this query, we will receive data in this shape. As you can see, with GraphQL, we don't need to receive the data that we don't want, and we are able to ask for the data that we exactly want. Nothing more and nothing less. Now let's talk about underfetching, which is the opposite of overfetching. Underfetching means that you fetch less data than what you actually need. If we were making a movie app and we want to show two lists of movies, one for the movies that are coming up soon and one for the movies that are playing right now, if we were using a REST API, we would have to make two requests to two separate URLs. In the case of the movie database REST API, we would have to make a request to slash movie slash upcoming and slash movie slash now playing. This means that our phone, iOS or Android, or our website is going to have to make two requests. It will have to hit two URLs one after the other. That might increase loading time. If we were using GraphQL, because we can ask for exactly what we want, we don't have to send two requests. Instead, in one query, we can ask for the movie that are playing right now and the movies that are gonna play soon. And with a query like this one, we would receive a response like this one. How cool is this? We don't have to fetch two URLs. We also don't do overfetching because we don't get extra data that we don't need. This is how GraphQL solves underfetching and overfetching in a super elegant way. But this is not all GraphQL can do. GraphQL has other features that make building APIs with GraphQL a very pleasant experience. But unfortunately, we don't have time for all the GraphQL features on this video. And this is why I made a two and a half free hour GraphQL course that you can take right now. Click on the link below and there you will see what makes GraphQL even more awesome than what we already saw and how you can make your own GraphQL API. Now the question is, who should learn GraphQL? And the answer is, Everybody, if you have built a server before, if you have made a REST API before, I beg you, try GraphQL and I'm sure you are going to like it. It's a very different way of building APIs, but I am sure you're going to enjoy it. Thank you for watching this video. Let me know in the comments if you have used GraphQL, if you want to use GraphQL in the future, what do you think about it? I'm gonna be looking at them right now. Thank you so much for watching. Stay happy, stay free. It's Gimji, Kamsamida, Sananheyo. See you on the next one, bye-bye.